Good evening and welcome back to Booked for the Night. I'm your narrator, Melissa Phillips. Tonight I'm reading chapters 21 and 22 of The Island of Adventure by Enid Blyton. Enjoy. Chapter 21, Escape. But what about Jack? The bolts were shot back. The door opened and Jake appeared, carrying a tin plate of biscuits and a big open tin of sardines. He also put on the table a jug of water. Then he stared in amazement at the three children. Philip seemed to be choking, and he rolled off his bench on the floor. Dinah was making the most extraordinary noises and holding her head tightly in her hands. Lucianne appeared to be on the point of being sick and made the most alarming groans. "'What's up?' asked Jake. "'Air! We want air!' gasped Philip. "'We're choking! Air! Air!' Dinah rolled onto the ground as well. Jake pulled her up and hustled her to the door. He pushed the others out into the passage. He thought they must really be on the point of choking. The air in the cell must be used up. Philip watched his chance and reeled towards Jake as if he could not stand straight. As he came toward him, he lifted his right foot and aimed a mighty kick at the lantern in Jake's hand. It fell and smashed at once, and the light went out. There was a tinkling of glass, a shout from Jake, and then Philip sought for the hands of the two frightened girls. He found them and pushed the two hurriedly in front of him toward a passage on the left. Jake, left in the darkness, began to grope about, shouting for the other man. Ollie! Hi, Ollie! Bring a lamp! Quick! These dreaded kids have fooled me! Hey, Ollie! Philip, trying hard to keep his sense of direction correct, hurried the girls along. Their hearts were beating painfully, and Lucianne really did feel as if she was going to choke now. Soon they had left Jake's shouts behind and were in the wide main passage down which they had come not many hours before. Philip was now using his torch, and it was pleasant to see the thin, bright beam of light. "'Thank goodness! We're in the right tunnel,' said Philip, pausing to listen. He could hear nothing but the boom of the sea far above their heads. He swung his torch around. Yes, they were on the right road. Good.' Can we have a little rest? panted Lucianne. No, said Philip. Those men will be after us almost at once. As soon as they get another lamp, they will guess we are making for the shaft. Come on, there's no time to be lost. The children hurried on again, but after a time, to their great dismay, they heard shouts behind them. That meant that the men were after them, and what was more, were catching them up. Lucianne felt so alarmed that she could hardly run. They came at last to the big shaft hole. It was so deep that the children could not see the entrance to it, far above. The daylight was not to be seen. "'Up you go,' said Philip anxiously. "'You first, Lucianne. Be as quick as you can.' Lucianne began to climb. Dinah followed her. Philip came last. He could hear the men's voices even more clearly now. And then, quite suddenly, they stopped, and Philip could hear them no more. What had happened?' An extraordinary thing had happened. Kiki the parrot, hearing the tumult in the distance, had become excited and was shouting. She and Jack were still wandering about, quite lost, in the maze of passages and galleries. Kiki's sharp ears heard the men, and she began to screech and yell. Wipe your feet! Shut the door! Hi, hi, hi! Polly, put the kettle on! The men heard the shouting voice and thought it belonged to the children. They've lost themselves, said Jake, stopping. They don't know the way back to the shaft. They're lost and are shouting for help. Let them shout, said Ollie sourly. They'll never find the way to the shaft. I told you they wouldn't. Let them get lost and starve. No, said Jake. We can't do that. We don't want to have to explain half-starving children to search parties, do we? We'd better go and get them. They're over in that direction. They went off the main passage, meaning to try and find the children where the shouts had come from. Kiki's voice came again to them. Wipe your feet, idiot! Wipe your feet! This astonished the two men. They went on towards the voice, but even as they went, Jack and Kiki wandered into a passage that the two men missed. Kiki fell silent, and the men paused. Can't hear them anymore, said Jake. Better go to the shaft. They may have found their way there after all. We can't afford to let them escape till we've decided what to do about all this. So they retraced their steps to the shaft and looked up it. A shower of stones came down and hit them. Gosh, the children are up there, cried Jake, and started up the ladder at once. The children were almost to the top. 
Lucy Ann felt as if her arms and legs could not climb one more rung, but they held out, and at last the tired girl reached the top, climbed out, and rolled over on the ground, exhausted. Dinah came next and sat down with a long sigh, and then Philip, tired too, but determined not to rest for one moment. I'm sure those men will come up the shaft after us, he said. We haven't a minute to lose. Come on, girls. We must get to the boat and be off before anyone stops us. It was getting dark. What a long time they must have been underground. Philip dragged the girls to their feet and they set off to the shore. The boat was there, thank goodness. I don't want to go without Jack, said Lucianne obstinately. Her heart wrung with anxiety for her beloved brother, but Philip bundled her into her, the boat at once. No time to lose, he said. Come on, we'll send help back for Jack as soon as ever we can. I can't bear leaving him behind either, but I've got to get you girls away safely. Dinah took one pair of oars and Philip took the other. Soon the two were rowing the boat away quickly, across the calm channel of water to where, in the distance, the waves thundered over the reef of rocks. Philip felt anxious. It was one thing to get through the gap safely when he could see where he was going, but quite another when it was almost dark. He heard shouting, but it was too far away from the shore to see the men there. Jake and Ollie had climbed up the shaft, raced over the island to the shore, and were looking for a boat, but there was none. The tide was coming in, and there was not even a mark on the sand to show where the boat had rested. In fact, it had been almost afloat when the children had got in, and it was lucky that it, that it had not floated away. "'No boat here,' said Ollie. How did those kids come? It's strange. They must have escaped by boat. They can't still be underground. We'd better signal tonight and get someone over here. We must warn them that kids have found us underground. They went back to the shaft and climbed down it, not knowing that one of the children was still wandering about in the mines. Poor Jack was still making his way down a maze of tunnels, all looking exactly alike to him. In the meantime, Philip, Lucian, and Dinah had, by great good luck, just struck the gap in the rocks. It was really because of Lucienne's sharp ears that they had been so lucky. She had listened to the pounding of the water over the rocks, and her ears had noticed a softening of the thunder. That's where the gap must be, she thought. The noise dies away a little there. So, sitting at the tiller, she tried to guide the boat to where she guessed the gap to be, and by good chance, she found it. The boat slipped through, scraping its keel once more on the rock just below the surface and then it was in the open sea, rocking up and down. How Philip put up the sail in the half-darkness and sailed the boat home, he never quite knew. He was desperate. They must get back safely. So with great courage, he went about his task. When at last he reached the mooring place under the cliff, he could not get out of the boat. Quite suddenly, his knees seemed to give away, and he could not walk. "'I'll have to wait a minute or two, he said to Dinah. "'My legs have gone funny.' I'll be all right soon. You've been awfully clever, said Dinah, and from her, those, meant, those words meant a lot. They tied up the boat at last and went up the house. Aunt Polly met them at the door in a great state of alarm. Wherever have you been? I've been so worried about you. I've been nearly off my head with anxiety. I really feel faint. She looked very white and ill. Even as she spoke, she tottered a little, and Philip bounded forward and caught her as she fell. Poor Aunt Polly, he said, dragging her indoors as gently as he could and putting her on the sofa. We're so sorry we upset you. I'll get some water. No, Dinah, you get some. Soon Aunt Polly said she felt a little better, but it was quite plain that she was ill. She could never stand any worry of this sort, Dinah said to Lucianne. Once Philip nearly fell down the cliff. She was ill for days. It seems to make her heart bad. I'll get her to bed. Don't say a word about Jack being missing, Philip warned Dinah in a low voice. That really will give her a heart attack. Dinah went off upstairs with her aunt, supporting her as firmly as she could. Philip went to look for Joe. He wasn't back yet. Good. Then he wouldn't have missed the boat. He looked at Lucianne's white little face, its green tired eyes and worried expression. He felt sorry for her. What are we going to do about Jack? said Lucianne with a gulp. We've got to rescue him, Philip. I know, said Philip. Well, we can't tell Aunt Polly, and Uncle Jocelyn wouldn't be any good. 
and we'd be idiots to tell Joe, so there is no one left but Bill, I'm afraid. But you said we'd better not tell Bill we knew a secret, said Lucy Ann. I know, but we've got to now that Jack is alone on the island, said Philip. Bill will have to go and tell those fierce friends of his that Jack is a pal, and he'll find him and bring him back safely. So don't worry, Lucy Ann. Will you go and tell him now, straight away? asked Lucy Ann tearfully. I'll go just as soon as ever I've had something to eat, said Philip, suddenly feeling so hungry that he felt he could eat a whole loaf, a pound of butter, and a jar of jam. You'd better have something too, Lucy Ann. You look as white as a sheet. Cheer up. Jack will soon be safe here, and we'll all be laughing and talking like anything. Dinah came down then and set about getting some food. They were all very hungry, even Lucy Ann. Dinah agreed that the only thing to do was to go to Bill Smugs and get him to go and rescue Jack before the men found him. They'll be so wild that we've escaped that they may be really tough with Jack, said Dinah, and then wished she hadn't spoken the words, for Lucy Ann looked scared to death. Please go, Philip, begged the little girl. Go now. If you don't, I shall. Don't be silly, said Philip, getting up. You don't want to make your way across the cliff on a dark night. You'd fall over the edge. Well, so long. I'll be back. Off went the boy, climbing the steep path to the top of the cliff. Then he set off to find Bill. He saw the lights of Joe's car in the distance coming home and heard the noise of the engine. He hurried so that he would not be seen. Bill will be surprised to see me, he thought. He'll wonder whoever it is knocking at his door in the middle of the night. But alas, Bill wasn't there when Philip at last arrived at the shack. Now what was he to do? Chapter 22. A Talk with Bill and a Shock Philip was filled with dismay. It had never occurred to him that Bill might not be at home. How awful! Philip sat down on a stool and tried to think, but he was tired out and his brain wouldn't seem to work. What shall I do now? What shall I do now? He thought and could not seem to think of anything else. What should I do now? It was dark in the little shack. Philip sat on the stool, his hands hanging limply between his legs. Then he became aware of something at the back of the shack, and he turned to see what it was. To his great amazement, he saw a red light there, glowing deeply. Then it disappeared. Then it came back again, went out, reappeared. It went on doing this for a few minutes, while Philip tried to think what it was and why it seemed to be signaling. At last he got up and went over to the light. It, it came from a small ball beside the radio. Philip had a look at it. He twiddled one or two knobs. A Morse code came from it when he twiddled another. Then by chance he saw, at the back of the set, a small telephone receiver, smaller than any he had seen before. Almost a pocket size, he thought. He picked it up and immediately he heard a voice crackling in the receiver. He lifted it to his ear. Why two calling, said the voice. Why two? Why two calling? Philip listened in, astonished. He decided to speak to the voice. Hello, he said. Who are you? There was a moment's silence. Evidently, why two, whoever he might be, was surprised. A cautious voice came over the phone as there. Who is there? A boy named Philip Mannering, said Philip. I came to find Bill Smugs, but he isn't here. Who did you say? said the voice. Bill Smugs, but he's not here, repeated Philip. I say, who are you? Do you want me to leave a message for Bill? I expect he'll be back sometime. How long has he been gone? asked Y2. Don't know, said Philip. Wait, I can hear someone. Here he comes, I do believe. Joyfully, the boy put down the tiny telephone receiver. He had heard the low sound of whistling outside and footsteps. It must be Bill. It was. He came in, shining his torch, and he was so surprised when he saw Philip that, there that he stood shocked still, without saying a word. Oh, Bill, said Philip joyfully. I'm so glad you've come. Quick, somebody wants you on the phone. Why, too, he says he is. Did you speak to him? said Bill, his voice sounding astonished. He picked up the tiny phone and spoke curtly. Is that why, too? L4 speaking. The voice evidently asked him who Philip was. Boy that lives around here, said Bill. What's the news, please? 
Then all that was said by Bill was, yes, of course, I'll let you know, thanks, no, nothing yet, goodbye. He turned to Philip when he had finished talking. Look here, my boy, he said. Please understand that if you come paying calls here when I am out, you must on no account tamper with my possessions or meddle with my affairs. Bill had never spoken so sternly before, and Philip's heart sank. What would Bill say when he knew that the children had guessed his secret? He would think they had been meddling more than ever. Sorry, Bill, he said awkwardly. I didn't mean to interfere at all. Why have you come at this time of night? asked Bill. Bill, is this your pencil? asked Philip, taking it out. He hoped that when Bill saw it, he would remember that he had dropped it down in the copper mines and would guess, without Philip saying any more, that the children knew his secret. Bill stared at the yellow pencil stub. Yes, that's mine, he said, but you didn't come here at night to give me my pencil back. What have you come for? Oh, Bill, don't be so cross, said poor Philip. You see, we know your secret. We know what you're doing here. We know why you go to the island. We know everything. Bill listened to all of this as, as if he simply could not believe his ears. He stared at Philip in the utmost amazement. His eyes grew narrow and his mouth hardened into a thin line. For a moment, he looked very frightening. You are going to tell me exactly what you mean by all this, said Bill in a horrid sort of voice. What is my secret? What is the everything that you know? Well, said Philip desperately, we know that you and your friends are trying to work the copper mines again, and we know that you are here with your boat and your car to provide them with food and to take away any copper they find. We know you've been down the mines visiting the men there. We know you've given us a false name. But please, Bill, we wouldn't dream of giving you away. We hope you'll get lots of copper. Bill listened, his eyes still narrow. But as Philip went on talking, the twinkle came back into them, and his mouth looked like Bill's again. Well, 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 so you do know all that, said Bill. And what else do you know? How did you get to the island? Not in my boat, I hope. Oh, no, said Philip, relieved to see Bill looking friendly again. We took Joe's when he was out. We went right down into the mines, too. That was where we found your pencil. But we don't like your friends there, Bill. They took us prisoner. They're horrid, and even when we mentioned your name to them and said we were friends of yours, they said they didn't know it and wouldn't let us go free. You told them you knew Bill Smugs, said Bill. Philip nodded. What men did you see, asked Bill. His voice had become sharp again, and he snapped out his questions in rather a frightening manner. Two, one called Jake and one Ollie, said Philip. Bill made a note in his notebook. What were they like, he asked sharply. Well, but you must know them, said Philip in astonishment. Anyway, I couldn't really see much. Either it was dark or the light dazzled me. I just saw that Jake was tall and dark with a patch over one eye. That's all. But you must know what they are like yourself, Bill. See anyone or anything else, asked Bill. Philip shook his head. No, we heard other miners at work, though. A terrific clattering, banging sort of noise, you know. They must have found some part of the mine that was still rich in copper. Bill, are you finding much copper there? Will it make you rich? Look here, you didn't come here tonight to tell me all this, said Bill suddenly. What did you come for? I came to say that although Dinah and Lucien and I managed to fool Jake and get away, we had to leave Jack behind, with Kiki, said Philip, and we are worried about him. You see, he might get lost forever in those workings under the sea, or those friends of yours might find him and ill-treat him because they are angry at or tricking them as we did. Jack's still there? On the island? In the mines? said Bill, looking quite shocked. Good heavens! This is serious! Why didn't you tell me that first? My word, it looks as if everything is going to be ruined by you kids. Bill looked angry and upset. He went to his radio, fiddled about with the knobs, and then, to Philip's amazement, began to talk in short, sharp tones in a language the boy did not know. It's a transmitter as well as a receiving set, thought Philip. This is all very mysterious. Who is Bill talking to now? Have they all got a boss who is directing this copper mine affair? I suppose there's very big money in it. Oh dear, I hope we haven't really ruined things for them. 
What does Bill mean? How could we have spoilt everything? He's only got to go over to the island, see his friends, tell them to set Jack free, and that would finish it. He might know he can trust us not to split on him. Bill turned around. We must get the boat at once, he said. Come on. With their torches throwing beams of light before them, they went down to where the boat was kept. Bill began to push it out, and then he suddenly gave such a shout that Philip's heart nearly jumped out of his body. Who's done that? Bill shone his torch into the boat, and Philip saw, with a shock of dismay and fear, that someone had chopped viciously at the bottom of the boat, chopped so hard that there were holes there through which the water was even now pouring. Bill pulled her back on the beach again, his face very grim. Do you know anything about that? He asked Philip. Of course not, said the boy. Golly, who did it, Bill? This is awful. Well, the boat is no use at all till she's repaired, said Bill. But somehow we've got to get over to the Isle of Gloom. We'll have to take jo Joe's boat. Come on. But mind, he mustn't know a thing about it. There's too much known about everything already, and too many people nosing about for my liking. They set off over the cliffs, poor Philip so tired that he could hardly keep up with Bill. They came to Craggy Tops, climbed down the cliff path, and made their way to where Joe's boat was always tied. But, to their intense surprise and despair, Joe's boat was not there. It was gone. Thanks for joining us for tonight's edition of Booked for the Night. I'll be back tomorrow night with more of The Island of Adventure by Enid Blyton. Thanks for listening, and good night.